Hi everyone, this is just a slightly modified version of my previous video, Should You Put a Parachute in Your Sling TSI? In that video, I mentioned two companies from which you can buy parachutes for your sling. I included a promotional animation from one of those companies. After I uploaded that video, that company filed a copyright takedown notice with YouTube and informed me that I could only use their animation if I removed any references to their competitor. I didn't want to do that, so I was forced to take down the previous video and upload this edited version. It contains the same basic information, just without their little animation. If you've seen any of my other videos, you know that I own and fly a Sling TSI. The Sling TSI, as well as other Sling airplanes, can be equipped with a whole aircraft ballistic parachute system, kind of like a Cirrus. But unlike a Cirrus, it's an option in the Sling. So, sling builders have a decision to make. Should I put a parachute in my sling or not? This video will explore the pros and cons of equipping your sling TSI with a parachute. First, let me say that my purpose in this video is not to change anyone's opinion. Everyone has a different appetite for risk, and that's an individual decision. This video just serves to present information for you to consider when making your own risk assessment. There may be factors you haven't thought of, and I simply want everyone to make the most informed decision as possible. At the end of the day, we might all look at the same information and still come to a different conclusion, and that's totally fine. Let's start with the pros. It's a safety device, right? This is a point about which I know some are skeptical, so let's dive into it. The first thing, and sometimes the only thing, that most pilots think about with regard to the parachute is engine failures. So I'll deal with that first. Some pilots say, who needs a chute when I can just dead stick it in? Okay, maybe you can. Let's examine that. Once you're committed to land with an engine failure, one of the most critical decisions to make is where to land. If you can't glide to a runway, top choices are often a field or a road. The absolute minimum touchdown speed, if you're able to fully configure and perfectly manage your speed, is VSO. That's 48 knots indicated on the TSI, or 55 miles an hour. In other words, highway driving speed. That's at sea level density altitude. Any higher density altitude means your speed would be even faster. If you choose to dead stick it onto a road, there's always a chance of impacting a car or truck. Of course, you'll try to minimize that by landing with the traffic, if at all possible. Hopefully you can find a long, straight, rural highway with few cars and no obstacles, but you can't always count on that. Obstacles often found near roads include signposts, overpasses, power lines, power poles, light poles, etc. Smaller power lines can be difficult to see from a distance, especially when your field of view is narrowed from stress. There's probably no cars in a field, but there could be other hidden dangers. Is there anything in that field that you might strike when touching down at highway speed? Are there any hidden ruts, furrows, berms, rocks, fences, poles, retaining walls, or other structures? Unfortunately, many times it's difficult to see the obstructions from altitude when you picked out the field. They may only come into view when you're on short final and committed to landing. As I fly around the country, I'm always paying attention to the surrounding terrain, wondering where I could land if I couldn't reach an airport. Sometimes I look around and think, I could land almost anywhere around here. There's tons of wide open fields everywhere. Other times I look around and think, there's nowhere good to land around here. More often than not, it's a middle ground. Many times there's thick forests for miles with a few fields here and there. Sometimes I'll look at the fields and think, I might be able to dead stick into this one or that one. Sometimes they're short enough that after clearing the trees on the approach end, I'm not sure I could get the plane down and stopped in time before hitting the trees on the other end. You've got one chance to get it right. How many landings have you done with no engine power where you touch down exactly on the target point, exactly at VSO? When I was a full-time flight instructor, I noticed that often pilots who hadn't practiced engine out landings recently would require three times before they got it right. The first time, they would typically come up short of the field. They were not used to their airplane's descent angle with no engine power, and they're often surprised that it's steeper than they expected. The second time, they would overcompensate, overshoot the target, and land long. Then the third time, they'd get the hang of it. Again, you've only got one shot in a real-life emergency, so be sure to practice this often. 
So let's say you do practice dead stick landings all the time and you're confident that you can dead stick it into almost any field. Here's the thing. You could do everything right. Fly the best glide speed, pick a field, land right on target and right at VSO, but end up hitting something which might bring you to an abrupt halt or flip the airplane. Even if you don't hit something, just a hard landing can result in a flip. As violent as a 55 mile an hour car crash would be, it could be worse in an airplane. Since collision is a much higher probability in a car versus an airplane, cars are designed with far more crash survival features than our airplanes are. Our airplanes don't have the crumple zones, roll cages, multiple airbags, etc. that cars do. Oh, by the way, do you know the wind direction at the surface? Imagine you're three hours into a cross country. Have you been tracking the surface winds the whole time as you progress across the country? Maybe you can find some clues like smoke or a flag, but you can't count on it. Yes, our avionics can display winds, but that's at your current altitude. The winds could be substantially different at the surface. Many times on approach I've seen a tailwind at a thousand feet, even though there's a headwind at the surface. So, if you don't know the surface winds, you could be landing with a tailwind, making your approach and touchdown speed even faster. This is a good time to discuss energy. Injury severity in an accident increases along with kinetic energy, which is equal to one half of the vehicle mass multiplied by the square of the vehicle speed. This means that the kinetic energy in a collision greatly increases with speed and consequently, small increases in vehicle speed can result in large increases in the severity of injury. For example, when speed increases from 40 to 60 miles an hour, a 50% increase, the energy that needs to be managed is increased by 125%. This additional energy needs to be absorbed and dissipated, challenging the vehicle structure and increasing the likelihood of severe injuries. As mentioned previously, even if you're Chuck Yeager and if you do everything perfectly, the minimum speed you can possibly touch down is at VSO, which in the TSI is 48 knots or 55 miles an hour. Under the parachute, you touch down at 14 knots. Energy increases at the square of the velocity, so and doing a dead stick landing, your energy is about 12 times higher than coming down under the chute. Now the math would be different if you had a stole airplane with a really slow stall speed, like 25 knots or something, but this is the math for the sling TSI. So obviously, the ideal situation in a dead stick landing is to touch down on a surface that allows you to decelerate over a distance, like a normal landing. The issue is, if you impact something at any speed higher than 14 knots, your kinetic energy will be higher than it would be under the chute, and therefore the likely severity of injury will be higher. Of course, we know that dead stick landings can be successful, but how often are they successful? Well, Ron Wontaija, an engineer, pilot, and writer for Kit Planes Magazine, studied over 20 years of aircraft accident data involving engine failures in experimental amateur-built aircraft. In that, he found that engine failure accidents had a 21% fatality rate. Some might look at that as being good odds. Nearly 80% of the time you'll live. Perhaps a more sober way to look at it is one of every five engine failure accidents are fatal. Breaking that down further, he found that many pilots stalled the airplane while attempting a dead stick landing. If you remove all the stalls, the fatality rate for dead stick landings improves to 15.5%. However, the fact remains that many pilots do stall while attempting the dead stick, and of those who did, the fatality rate was a whopping 61%. And this is to say nothing of the injuries. We don't have data on that. It's safe to assume that some percentage of those who survive will end up with severe, sometimes life-altering injuries. So why are so many pilots stalling? I think it goes back to my comment that when practicing dead stick landings, most pilots end up short of their target the first time. They overestimate their glide ratio, pick out a spot to land, and then they realize they're not going to make it. Imagine gliding for a field beyond some trees, then realizing you're going to hit the trees. Many pilots, hoping to get beyond the trees to their field, will just keep pulling back until they stall. More often than not, that's a fatal mistake. When you stall, what happens to the aircraft attitude? It pitches nose down. The last thing you want to do is touch down with high energy in a nose down attitude. What do we know about the fatality rate when coming down under the chute? To my knowledge, there has yet to be a sling that has deployed the chute in flight. 
If you check for data on in-flight deployments of whole aircraft ballistic parachutes, naturally you're going to be looking mostly at incidents involving Cirrus airplanes, since they have the most planes flying with chutes installed. Cirrus says there has been zero fatalities to date when the chute has been deployed within demonstrated parameters. Some pilots have deployed their chutes beyond these parameters, both in terms of altitude and speed, and have still survived. But clearly, the fatality rate will increase the further one goes beyond these parameters. Most documented death involved the pilots waiting too long and then deploying the chute at too low of an altitude. One death involved a loss of control accident in which the aircraft was 270 knots when the chute was deployed. That's over 100 knots beyond the VPD, and the chute failed at that extreme speed. But even including deployments outside of demonstrated parameters, according to a study by Wright State University, you're 13 times more likely to survive an accident in a Cirrus airplane when the chute is deployed. Note how tightly correlated the survival rate is with the energy difference. 12 times the energy difference, 13 times the fatality rate. I don't think that's a coincidence. Maybe you're still confident that you can successfully pull off a dead stick landing anytime, any place. All right. What if a catastrophic engine failure left your windshield obscured with oil? What about at night? Are you sure you can find a safe spot to land on a dark, moonless night? What if you're in the clouds? How confident are you now? Some pilots just never fly at night or in IMC, and that's a viable safety policy, but it sure limits the use of your airplane as a traveler. If you spent a lot of time, effort, and money to get your instrument rating and equip your airplane with an IFR panel, you're probably going to want to use that capability. So, if you do, what's your plan if your only engine fails while you're in the clouds or at night? The great Mike Patey has a rule. If flying at night, you need some kind of backup. I'd say the same applies in IMC. In his opinion, the plane has to have a turbine, twin engines, or a chute. So personally, I think I've already made a strong case for the parachute as a safety device, especially if flying at night or an IMC. But even on a severe clear day, the chute still dramatically improves the survivability in case of an engine failure. So far, all we've talked about are engine failures, but that's not the only thing the chute is good for. The largest cause of fatal accidents in general aviation is loss of control in flight. Loss of control could happen for a number of reasons. First is the classic pilot disorientation, such as a VFR pilot flying into the clouds, or spatial disorientation at night. Of course, for those of us equipped with a modern autopilot, the first thing you do in this case is push the level button. However, it's possible to be beyond the limits for the autopilot to recover with the level button. In Cirrus training, they have an expression, if it doesn't work to push blue, pull red. Another scenario is being outside of the flight envelope, such as in a stall or a spin and unable to recover. Perhaps you are inadvertently loaded with an FCG, which makes it more difficult to recover. A third possibility of loss of control is mechanical failure, such as flight controls jammed or otherwise broken. And then there's severe icing. And this has actually happened in a Cirrus. A pilot got his SR-22 iced up in the clouds, which caused his plane to stall and spin. Despite using proper control inputs to break the spin, he could not recover with all the ice on the wings. He deployed the chute, and all three people aboard survived with no injuries. Another case for chute deployment would be structural failure. This, too, could happen for a number of reasons. The most obvious is a mid-air collision. Usually, we think of this in terms of another aircraft, and there have been live saves by chute deployments after two airplanes have hit each other in flight. But a newer threat that's on the rise is mid-air collisions with drones. Imagine flying with your flaps down and a drone hits one of your flaps and it departs the aircraft. If a drone can make this much damage on a large wing, imagine how badly it could damage your horizontal stabilizer, for example, and how that would affect your controllability. A bird strike could damage controllability in a similar manner especially the larger species like the Canada goose. Imagine if the bird that damaged this airliner hit your wing or horizontal stabilizer. Another cause of structural failure is overstressing the airplane. This is often associated with aerobatic flying, but it could be caused by loss of control events such as a classic graveyard spiral. 
And lastly, extreme turbulence could cause structural failure. The majority of structural failure accidents from turbulence involve pilots penetrating thunderstorms. Obviously, don't do that. Structural failure from extreme turbulence outside of thunderstorms is not as common, but remains a possibility. An additional case for chute deployment would be pilot incapacitation. This could be caused by internal factors such as a heart attack, stroke, or other loss of consciousness, or external causes such as hypoxia, carbon monoxide poisoning, or smoke or fumes in the cockpit. And going back to a previously mentioned threat, Imagine taking a drone or a large bird through the window. A pilot could be injured or incapacitated if parts of a bird, drone, or pieces of the windshield hits the pilot. Now, when flying with non-pilot family members, it's easy to say, just teach them how to fly in case you become incapacitated. That's a great idea. But what if you become incapacitated in an IMC? Will your family members be instrument rated? What about other less than optimal conditions? like at night, or gusty crosswinds, etc. You probably got your pilot license and other advanced ratings because you love flying and take safety seriously. Let's say your spouse doesn't share the same passion for aviation that you do, but they just want to learn the basics so they could land the plane just in case. How proficient will they be? If you're an experienced and proficient pilot and your spouse is not, it's safe to say that there are some conditions in which you're comfortable to fly, but your spouse would not be. Will you be sure to modify your go-no-go -go decision for flights based on weather conditions limited by the least experienced pilot at a control seat? Or what about couples where both spouses are equally qualified, proficient, and experienced pilots? That's great. But might you ever fly with someone else who's not a pilot? Maybe take your non-pilot friends on a pleasure flight or trip with you? What's their out if you become incapacitated? So let's talk about some of the downsides of the chute. The first is the expense. There's initial expense and there's ongoing maintenance. The expense varies depending on which parachute you choose. The initial cost for the Magnum is $11,000 and the initial cost for the BRS is $20,000. The ongoing expense involves repacking the canopy and replacing the rocket. That costs about $3,400 every six years for the Magnum, or $4,400 every 10 years for the BRS. So that expense just kind of is what it is. You'll have to make your own value judgment on whether it's worth it. The next downside is space. The parachute does take up space in the baggage compartment. For my mission, it really hasn't been an issue. And the best way I can demonstrate that is to show you in the video. So all this, believe it or not, is going to fit inside that airplane. This is the baggage compartment. It doesn't look very big and it's not, but all that will fit in here. So duffel bag one. It goes into this, there's an extension here. It goes about to this set of rivets. So one duffel bag goes in there. Now you got room for two more over here. Duffel bag two. Goes in this way. And duffel bag three. So, three duffel bags and a garment bag on top, and it doesn't even go over the top of the back of the seats. And if I wanted to, I could stack to the ceiling and put a cargo net or a curtain to uh, secure that into place. The third downside is weight and balance. It obviously adds weight, and due to its location in the aircraft, it moves the CG aft. This can pose a weight and balance challenge with certain loading scenarios. The best way I can demonstrate this is to show you some weight and balance from a few different airplanes with and without a parachute. So this is a Sling TSI that belongs to a friend of mine. It does not have the parachute and you can see what the empty weight is and the CG of that airplane empty right here. Now this is my airplane that has a parachute. It has the Magnum parachute. And you can see mine is 
about 52 pounds heavier than his when empty. And you can see even while empty, my CG is further aft. Now this is my friend's CSI without the parachute with three adults, full bags and full fuel tanks. And you can see that he's well within the CG envelope. This is my airplane with the parachute in the same loading. As you can see, I start out within the CG envelope, but as fuel burns, the CG moves aft. Now this is a scenario with me burning 35 gallons, and when I get to 10 gallons, I am now after the CG limit. So what I did to remedy that is I added a couple of 25 pound ballast bricks between the firewall and the rudder pedals. And that brings me well within CG limits with the same loading. An alternative is to put ballast on the gearbox, which some Sling TSI owners have done. And since that is further forward, it takes less weight to bring the CG within the envelope. Now this is my friend's airplane without the parachute with four adults on board, full fuel, but no bags and you can see it's within the CG envelope. And this is my airplane with the same four people and full fuel and no bags. And I'm also still within the CG envelope. So back to my friend's TSI with no parachute, four people, full fuel, and this time with 40 pounds of bags, he can be within the CG envelope. Unless he burns too much fuel, then at some point he will also end up aft of CG. So this is a loading that I can't do on my airplane with the parachute, but the only difference here is 40 pounds of bags. And that's only 10 pounds of bags per passenger. So to me, it's not much of a difference. It's either an airplane that can carry four adults and no bags or three adults and bags. And that's true whether you have the parachute or not. Now, granted, these are relatively light passengers. If you have heavier passengers, it may be different for you uh, in any case, but the heavier passengers up front is generally what helps with loading. And just to show that this is not an issue that's unique to this Link TSI, this is an RV-10, and this is the same for passengers, 40 pounds of bags and full fuel. And you'll see it's right up to the max takeoff weight and it's within center of gravity without the parachute. But if you add a parachute, you will end up after CG limits and overweight, and this is without 40 pounds of bags. So it's the same issue. Their, their parachute is heavier, it's 82 pounds because it needs a bigger parachute because it's the bigger airplane. But it's a, a similar issue that it's gonna be difficult to carry for adult passengers with the parachute. And one more point of comparison, this is an SR-22, same for passengers, 40 pounds of bags and full fuel. You're right up against the limit of your max takeoff weight. The CG is fine, since that was designed from the very beginning with the parachute, but the fact remains that almost any four-seat general aviation aircraft, certified or not, are going to have a hard time carrying four passengers and bags with full fuel. As many of you already know, I put a chute in my TSI. I'll tell you my closing thoughts on why in a moment, but first I want to include a couple of video snippets. I was recently watching a video over at the Experimental Aircraft channel in which they were having a discussion on safety in general aviation. The panel was asked, what would best benefit us that we could add into an airplane to improve survivability in an airplane accident? Here are the answers given by Mike Patey and Josh Flowers. Uh, honestly, I think one of the safest things already been done. Um, a lot of people um, kind of knock sometimes the the Cirrus parachute. Yeah. Um, you know that that is one of the lightest weight, greatest return on pound per pilot survived technologies in history of aviation, and uh, it, it continues to be. So I love to see that happen. If I had to narrow it down to one one safety innovation, I, I think it would be the, the airframe parachute um, because it is such a nice, it, it should not be an excuse to fly yourself into stupid situations, which I think is where it's, it can get its bad reputation and Cirrus kind of gets that 
that weird stigma that's attached to it. But I think Cirrus is one of the one of the greatest, most safe airplanes out there on the market, at least in the certified world. You know, I can't say that with an absolute, but it's it's a, it's an amazing airplane, uh, and the the par- the parachute is just the game changer there. To me, the safety pros outweigh the cons. I look at it like insurance. Some might say it's a waste to carry insurance for events that may never happen to you. You may go your entire flying career and never have any of these things happen to you. But it's important to know that emergencies like those mentioned in this video do happen. For me, it's not about how likely it is to happen to me. It's about the potential consequences if it did happen. To me, the consequences are so great that it's worth carrying insurance, even though it's likely I'll never have to use it. And I hope that I don't ever need it. But if I do, I'll be glad I have it. And you might come to a different conclusion, and again, that's totally fine. I can respect your decision, and hopefully you can respect mine. Now, for those of you who have decided on equipping their sling with a parachute, you may be interested in my next video. There, I'll discuss best practices and other considerations when deciding if and when to deploy the chute.